So we are talking about peace on earth, and you hear that sentiment uh, quite a bit this time of year. It shows up in uh, Christmas decorations, Christmas cards, uh, shows up in ad campaigns. Uh, peace on earth is pretty popular out there, and not anything wrong with that. And uh, you, you ought to want peace on earth. Like most of uh, the Christmas traditions that uh, get captured by uh, the rest of the world at some level, this one too comes from God's Word. I want to read from Luke chapter 2, verse 8. In the same re- region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. Peace. Now, in spite of that theme of peace, the angelic declaration, peace on earth, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what peace is and what peace isn't. Uh, I had a video that I thought about using for today, and Decided it'd take too long, and the message was too consistently captured by a short statement. I'll tell you a little bit about it. It was a man on the street interview. And they said, have you ever known peace? And then there were a whole series of people in the, on, on the street interview who answered, have you ever known peace? And overwhelmingly, people said, yes. There was a time several years ago that... Like, there's this little bitty window where I knew peace for just a moment. They ask, how, when do you feel peace? Person after person. Well, I feel peace when I am barefoot walking in the sand on the beach. One person said, I feel peace when I am out hunting all by myself and I'm finally away from people. I feel peace when I'm up in the mountains Drinking my cup of coffee on the porch of my mountain uh, getaway. I think, well, that's a rotten way to experience peace. It's just a snapshot of peace. It's it's just a a quick glimpse, a, a touch of peace. But it's not the ongoing experience of peace that God promises us. That's just a whole different thing. And a lot of misconceptions about peace is defined in Scripture. Let me share this with you. There are external things that can rob us maybe of our peace. There are internal factors that come to play on our peace. Uh, Some of those external factors, I don't know if you knew this or not. There's a global index of peace that evaluates peace in the world based on external factors. Peace in the world every year. So this, this is kind of fun reading I get to do. I read the findings of the 2018th Global Index of Peace. Here, aren't you glad you came to church today so you could find out about this kind of stuff? The index focuses on societal things, safety, security, ongoing domestic and international conflicts, uh, degree of militarization, so that's how they, they measure. But the analysis of their criteria, they said that the global level of peace deteriorated 27% in 2018. So this is for this, this year. It also showed 92 countries lost ground on peace, became less peaceful. 71 countries in the world became slightly more peaceful, improved a little bit. The reasons for less peace, uh, increased conflict, crisis in regions like the Middle East, where things have elevated uh, quite a bit in 2018. Six of the world's nine regions, so they divide the world into nine different regions, six of the nine became less peaceful this year. Uh, And that, by the way, that included four of the regions that typically are the most peaceful. They lost ground. Uh, Europe, North America, 
Asia Pacific area and uh, South America. The largest loss of peace by, the, by their multiple measures was in South America where conflict has elevated a lot of uh, instability in at the high government level, a lot of protests that are sweeping uh, South American countries, and so that's uh, where a lot of the loss came. The most peaceful country in the world we'll do the play at home version. What do you think? Most peaceful country in the world. Where? Iceland. Guy's been reading my stuff. You came to the, did you come to the first hour, David? You didn't, you didn't cheat? Okay. Iceland is the most peaceful country in the world by, by their measure. Because there's just nothing to do. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that, that's part, part of it. But so this morning, so I've had this study. Uh, and I knew I was going to use it. So this morning, I thought, I'm going to Google a couple of things about Iceland. The most peaceful country in the world. They're one of the highest countries in the world in suicide rate and depression. How about that? So obviously, if there's peace around you, doesn't mean there's a lot of peace in you. Uh, that is a fairly typical, uh, typical mark out there. Uh, the rest of the more peaceful nations, New Zealand, Austria, Portugal, and Denmark... On the other end of the spectrum. By the way, Iceland has been labeled the most peaceful country in the world since 2008. Since uh, the last five years, the least peaceful country in the world. Syria, which uh, shouldn't be a surprise to us. Uh, followed by the usual list of suspects, uh, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Iraq, and Somalia. Even the most peaceful region... In, uh, in the world, Europe had declined in peacefulness. Since 2008, 61% of Europe's countries have become less peaceful. In 2017, 23 countries in the region uh, deteriorated in peace. Now, that's just, that's just the outside factors, and, and you feel outside factors, not just at the global level like uh, they're, they're measuring in this index, but you feel it just the circumstantial stuff of life that, that starts eating away, chiseling away at your peace in your heart, in your life, in your family. Uh, there's some internal factors, too, that can do this. and There's so many things we could talk about when it comes to the internal factors that steal peace. I just chose three, and the reason is I can only think of three things that start with the letter G. So, you know, it's kind of a, prep, kind of a preaching thing. You, know, you, you want all your letters to start with the same letter, right? So here we go. First one that can steal away your peace is guilt. Do you know the reason we experience a lot of guilt in life? Because we're guilty. That's why. That's, that's why it's there. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that are guilt that because we have done things wrong. But here's what happens. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, He forgives your sin. He washes it all clean. But here's what happens. Satan comes in behind Him and says... He didn't really forgive you. What you did was really bad. You need to go back and revisit that again. And he starts reminding you of all these shortcomings and all these things. And before long, your guilt that's not a healthy guilt, but an unhealthy guilt, is uh, eating away at your heart. And listen, you don't have to walk, walk around like that. Jesus came. The reason he came was to take away your sin and your guilt and set you free. One of my favorite Christmas gifts I ever got as a child, as I wanted it so desperately, was an Etch-A-Sketch. Any of you ever have an Etch-A-Sketch growing up? You watch Elf and you saw Buddy uh, make these beautiful drawings. Mine were always just lines, just squiggly lines. That's all I could ever do on my Etch-A-Sketch. But the good part about an Etch-A-Sketch was, no matter how scrambled the, well, that didn't work out the way I thought it was going to, you just do that, and you start all over again. And that's how God's forgiveness works. He makes all things new. Jesus came so that you wouldn't be overcome by guilt, but that you could know peace in your heart. Don't let, uh, don't let guilt rob you of your peace. Uh, second letter, uh, it's a word that begins with the letter G, grief. Grief can rob us. And 
man, some of you, I know, I know your stories, and a lot of you, uh, just major pain right now. Uh, Christmas time seems to elevate. Whatever hurts, it just seems bigger in this season. And you remember, you've lost somebody you love. There's a relationship that's broken. Uh, it's something that's, that's as fresh as today. It's something that you've carried for years. And somehow, grief, when uh, you think about the losses of life, it just elevates at this season, and it steals your peace. And if you have pain you're carrying around, I want you to know this. Man, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry that you're feeling it. I'm sorry this is your journey. I'm sorry that it's heavy for you. And, and I pray for you, please share those things with me so I can li- keep you lifted up in prayer. This is what I do, what our church staff loves to do is to pray for folks. Um, but as much as I care about you, God cares about you infinitely more than that. And he, he cares about your hurt. He sees your hurt. He knows all about it. And you just weren't created by him to carry around that grief all on your own. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you, the Bible says. Give him your worries and your struggles and and just receive this gift of peace that he offers to us. Third, uh, Third word that can steal your peace, the internal level, grudges. It's when uh, you, uh, you've been hurt, somebody's hurt you, and, and you, you, carry, you carry it so tight that it becomes a resentment, a bitterness, and it starts to eat away at your soul, and you're going to be hurt in life. I mean, sometimes it happens intentionally, just some mean, mean people out there. Sometimes in, unintentionally. People don't even realize they're doing it. But uh, we, we are, one of my favorite images of community is we're, we're a bunch of porcupines trying to get along together. And when life is hard and it's cold, we try to get up close and we just end up poking each other. And uh, you can carry stuff for a long time, just... Anger and bitterness over something somebody did to you a long time ago. and There's something weird inside of our, our hearts that, that lies to us, Satan lies to us, makes us think, well, I can't forgive them because I'm not letting them off the hook that easy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep on being mad at them, bitter. And you know what that does to them? It affects them not at all. They just bouncing on through the holidays, singing jingle bells and whatever. And meanwhile, you're just worn out. Because bitterness, a grudge, resentment, it doesn't, it doesn't punish them. It just eats away at your own soul and steals away your peace that God intends for you. Uh, don't, don't let it be so. Uh, don't, don't let some other person from your past, from your present, hurt you today. You've got to let go of those things. And, well, well, they don't deserve it. Man, I don't deserve anything that God's ever given to me in forgiveness. But he's given it so generously. And he's done it over and over again. And I do the same thing over and over again. And I need to forgive the way he forgives. Well, the Bible keeps telling us to do it that way. Forgive as you've been forgiven. Not because you deserved it. Not because you earned it. Not because you're not going to do the same dumb thing again. But because God's a God of grace and we need to mirror his grace. Or else you get stuck. And some of you have just been stuck too long with a grudge or resentment and anger. and You need the peace that only comes from God. So how do, you, how do you experience that peace? I've told you you oughta. I've told you what it looks like. Well, how do you get there? And that's the outline that's in your program. We're going to try to flesh that out. And look at some things the Bible has to say about the peace of God that is so different. That brings light to the darkness around us and in us. And uh, here's the first thing about real peace. Peace is, having, is uh, having a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's simple enough, right? We're going to say that kind of stuff a lot around here. Having a relationship to Jesus is going to fix a whole lot of things that are broken in our world and in us. So we want to encourage people to have that relationship. A lot of people think that an absence of peace is a, is a horizontal problem. Like, hey, I'm struggling with peace. Why do you think that is? What would bring peace to your life? Well, I'll tell you, this is a guy at work. 
If, if God should just happen to remove him from the planet, my life would be a whole lot better. I would have, why do I not have peace? Well, it's my wife's fault. It's my husband's fault. It's my boss's fault. Oh, we, we, we love to point horizontally, but the reason we have relationship problems in the world that's broken is hor- in the horizontal level of relationships is because of this relationship problem, because of our sin. And so it's a vertical problem that causes the loss of our peace. According to the scriptures, the problem of peace is between God and folks who, because by nature and by choice, we are sinners separated, alienated from God. And that means we're going to be alienated from one another. And our relationship to God needs healing, like all our other relationships. And only God can bring that because he is a God of peace. So God said, I'm going to make peace with you. You can't pull it off. You can't do this, not by trying to be a good person or a religious person. I'm going, to, I'm going to deliver this to your doorstep. I'm coming to you. And God came down from heaven to this earth. Jesus Christ came to be the Prince of Peace. The prophet Isaiah wrote this years ahead, centuries ahead. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. All pointing toward Jesus. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. We sang that just a moment ago. In Isaiah 53, but he, Isaiah points to Jesus so much. He was pierced for our transgressions, talking about Jesus. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. You know, at the birth of Jesus, that, that angelic host, they weren't just mouthing greeting card things to the shepherds. They, they were announcing this unique historical event. The, the creator of heaven and earth was coming to his creation. The creator came to his creation to reconcile a sinful humanity. Our relationship to God is broken, and that means a lot's going to be broken in relationships. He came to reconcile, to take what was broken and make it whole, make it right, make it all healed. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. You think about this. So decades after Christ, he's sent back into heaven, years pass, and then the apostle, Saul, becomes the apostle Paul. He's on the road to Damascus. He has this dramatic experience with Christ. And that message of reconciliation he, he talks about it over and over again. One of my favorites is from Romans 5 where he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we decided Jesus is the only way it's all going to be made right. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you have peace with God, you have an excellent opportunity to have peace on earth. Real peace is knowing that God will never stop loving me. I think about Job and the, the crazy circus of his life how and there's a lot of I don't understand about the book of Job but it it resonates so with me I told you a week or two ago when I begin in January reading through my Bible one of my favorite ways to do it and I'll do it again this year I'll start with Isaiah it's my favorite way to start in January reading through my Bible in the in the year but I will read Job before February's done and those two books together seem to Put a lot of good, just get all my wheels under me for the new year. And Job, he goes through so much loss, loses people he loved. He loses all of his stuff. He loses his health. And Job makes this resounding declaration where he says, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. My hope is going to be in my Lord even if, it, if my life is lost, when all seems lost, just remember, it's not lost to God. He's the eternal one. He's the God of the impossible. He can take you through the weariness and pain you feel today. He can, he can bring you to a place of peace. Now, we live in this fallen world, and we say, <laughs> one of the things in a fallen world, sometimes the fallen world falls on you when you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Fallen slams into you. Fallen falls on you, and not all things work out as we would hope, as we would map the, the chart, but we know 
Uh, and we don't know, so I don't know what today's going to hold. I don't know what the future's going to hold. But God has promised in spite of the struggle, all thing, when, you're, when you're one of those people of faith, all things work together for good to those who love God or are called according to His purpose. When, when, when you're following Him, when you're walking with Him, all things work together for our good and for His glory, even the most painful of things. Your circumstances, uh, painful as they might be, are a path to some really good stuff. Uh, I, I shared in the first hour, uh, I, and I have, I have touched on this a few times in recent days. I'm sitting in this chair again today uh, for this reason. 2018 has been rotten for me, all kinds of ways. Um, my body, which has served me well, has not served me well in 2018. So uh, multiple system failures, you know. Some people have told me, well, Chad, uh, as my doctors keep saying, at your age, man, I hate you guys. I don't need to hear that, even if it's true. Um, but, but one of the things that's happened is I've had some chronic things. I mean, not like just a flash, but the things I've dealt with for most of 2018 every day uh, that, that are all new to me. And it is, it's caused me to, to read my Bible in a different way. It's caused me to, it's called me to pray in a broader way. Uh, it's caused me to, to lean into the Lord in some areas where I'd felt pretty self-sufficient for a while. And uh, that's how God does things. That he, he works in us through difficult things to accomplish a greater purpose because he's much more interested in my character than he is in the smoothness of my of my journey and nothing can be taken from you without God's permission nothing comes to you except it passes through his hands and the Lord gives and the Lord takes away as Job said blessed be the name of the Lord the Bible says Psalm 84 the Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right he and you know what he'll give a lot of good things by his grace to a knucklehead like me who's not doing it all right there's a lot, uh, the older I get, the less I understand about why God does things the way he does things. His timing, his plan, his purpose. But I have to learn to trust him and to stand in faith uh, no matter how great the storm that overwhelms. <laughs> that uh, last set of verses, verse 35 to 39 in Romans 8, uh, is a place I will visit uh, regularly in the course of a year. And he runs through a whole laundry list of things that, well, does God still love me if this happens? Can, is, that, is God's love still present if that happens? And, and he concludes by saying, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing. And that is peace. Third thing, real peace is knowing that God will never leave me alone. Some of you have been around our church long enough to, to uh, know, uh, have known Rebecca Jordan. And uh, some of you have been around the world long enough to know an old hymn uh, called Never Alone. And it's, uh, it, it's a great message. Rebecca does a lot of writing, and she's writing... A story about her mother. Her mother told her this story. She was, her mother was a young adult, young husband. They had a baby in a car in a previous generation when cars weren't quite feeling as secure as your car might have felt this morning coming to church. And they got caught in a terrible thunderstorm. And it was really rough and pouring down rain and bad road. And uh, she was worried. Okay, well, I'm, I'm feeling kind of helpless, feeling pretty vulnerable. And uh, she'd just come, though, she and her husband, Rebecca tells a story, from this meeting where B.B. B. McKinney had led the, the group at this church conference, had led them in singing this song, Never Alone. And it has some great words in it, especially if you're caught in a thunderstorm. And said, this is what her mom told her. She said, and then I started thinking, 
about that song, and I started singing it in that car. I've seen, this is from, straight from the song, I, I've seen the lightning flashing and heard the thunder roll. I felt sin's breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. I've, I've heard the voice of Jesus telling me still to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Rebecca said that when her mother, advanced in years, was dying, she was still singing that song. And it was that song that gave her courage as the Lord carried her right on to heaven. That's, uh, that's peace. The Bible is filled with the same faithful promise over and over again. Uh, the Lord told Joshua when he felt undone, outgunned, outmanned, I will not fail you or abandon you. When Jesus was preparing his disciples, he was about to return to heaven. Jesus vowed the same thing in his grieving, to his grieving disciples. No, I'll not abandon you as orphans. I'll come to you. And when he says, I'll come to you, he means I'm coming again and I'm going to make all things right, all things new. But between here and there, he promises them he's going to leave the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to come present with you every day, every moment, for everything, powerful, Holy God, Holy Spirit with you. And he says, uh, this is from the message in John 14, and that, the Holy Spirit, that is my parting gift to you, peace. I don't leave you the way you're used to being left, feeling abandoned and bereft. His Spirit is always with us. God will never leave me alone. That's the hope we have, the peace we have in him. Now, uh, number four, and I want to double check. Have we done three already? One, two, and three? Okay, you never know. So uh, I did, and I, and I do that because I, I get into this and I'm rolling along and uh, I still can't see out of my right eye particularly well. So I left, you, I left a point out of a sermon in one of the services about two months ago. People were start doubting their salvation and things because uh, some great theological point was missing from that sermon. They weren't sure what to do. Uh, so I hate to leave you hanging like that. Here's the fourth thing. Real peace means that no matter what happens, God is going to give me the strength to handle it. And as a disclaimer, my, my fingernails on a chalkboard statement that I hear in the world is, I have a lot going on, but I know God will never give me more than I can handle. And you know where that's found? Not in the Bible. God said, I'll never be tempted beyond what you can take, what you can handle, what you could overcome. But when it comes to, when it comes to challenges, here's the promise of God. He'll always give you more than you can handle. He will always throw you into the deep end of the pool. He will always put you in a spot where you have to trust in Him. He's going to take you down those roads, into those journeys, where you have nowhere to turn except to the Lord. And so, uh, and that was all free. Now, here's what it says when it comes to what you're going, getting on with what you're going through. He'll give you the strength in the journey, through the, through the storm. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. I'm so grateful for that verse in the Bible. There is no obstacle too great, no burden too big, no pain too profound for our God to deal with it on our behalf. Now, remember this. When you give your heart to Jesus, He lifts you out of the darkness and He puts you in the light. He'll restore your spirit. When you feel like you can't go on, he puts the fight back in you. No matter how lost, how broken, how sad, how defeated you feel in him, because he's the one who was raised from the dead, you pick up and you can go forward. Here's the fifth thing. Real peace is living by God's word, the Bible. And here's why. If, if you will read, if I will read the Bible regularly, daily, I can, first of all, just avoid a lot of disaster. The hurts, the habits, and the hang-ups that, that will trip us up, knock us down, you can just go around them if you'll read the Bible. So he'll save you from so much hurt, pain, difficulty, 
that's one of the great things about it. So I want to challenge you. This is, uh, we're, we're most of the way through December now. So here's my challenge to you. Read your Bible every day in 2019. I'm not discouraging you from reading the Bible the rest of December. But sure enough, in 2019, read your whole Bible through. And read your Bible every day. And when I say read the Bible every day, I'm not talking about the 10 verses you really like to tell you how awesome you are. I'm talking about read the whole Bible. Because you read the whole counsel of God's Word, you're going to find out a lot about God and a lot about you and a lot about the world and a lot about how all that works together. Don't read that whole thing. I recognize that is a time commitment. It could cost you around 15 to 20 minutes a day. In the first service, uh, during uh, uh, our second song, something like that, the choir was singing. Wonder, that wonderful, one of those wonderful songs. And uh, my phone buzzed. I thought it was a text. So my kids are out there somewhere in the world. And so always checking in on them. So I looked. It was not a text. It was just a message. My screen time, it said. Because it's very, my phone's very worried about me all the time. And I appreciate its concern. My screen time was down 14% uh, this week over last week. And I thought... I think I know why. I read my Bible more this week. I can give up uh, a little bit of screen time, spend a little more time in God's Word. You can find that little block of time uh, daily by just making a little bit of course adjustment. And you can read the whole Bible in a year. Certainly you can read through the New Testament in a year. Uh, Again, I told this for folks in the first service, and then it went south on me, but like many of the things I say, I'm not trying to scoreboard you when I say this, but I held down a full-time job this year. I mowed my yard and took out the trash and did all that stuff that people do, but I've read through the Bible. I'm, I'm finishing up my second time all the way through, and I read the New Testament three times, 2018. Because I felt like I really needed to spend a whole lot more time in God's Word this year. And again, it didn't take monstrous amounts of time. It just took a steady diet of God's Word every day. And by the way, I did scoreboard a bunch of it, didn't I? There you go. If I get out of my chair, I would take a bow. Read your Bible every day. Uh, in, uh, in reading my Bible through the second round, I read the Psalms last week. So Psalm 119 is on my mind because Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible and it's all about the Bible. It's all about God's Word. And it has so much great stuff in it. Uh, but, but this, I had to catch this one because of the sermon. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. That's a great takeaway. That's, a, that's one to remember. Now, what this verse says as I look into this new year, it's a dashboard verse. It's one of those diagnostics that you need in your spiritual life. Because if I'm rolling along in a day, in a week, and I feel, I feel fear, and I feel anxiety, and uh, I'm angry, things start popping up, those kind of things start popping up in my heart, in my life, it's probably uh, an alarm going off, dashboard light coming on, I'm not leaning enough into God's Word. Because if I'm leaning into God's Word, if I have a great love for His law, I'm going to have peace. And if my peace is wilting on me, uh, this is probably a pretty good way to try to get it back in place and reestablish that. I've lost my connection to God's Word. Great peace have those who love your law. And then nothing will make them stumble. You know, nothing can make you fall. God's Word will hold you up with peace in your heart in every circumstance if you're loving His law. And that, and that means, that, means that, that you and I, we're going to have to care more, more about God's law and what God says than for our personal comfort. We've got to care more about what God has to say than what other people are going to think about us or or how much money we make, or what kind of car we drive, or what kind of house we live in, or, or what society is screaming at us, we have to care more about what God says than anything else, or I'll lose my peace and I'll stumble. 
The psalmist needed peace. Psalm 119, one of the things I hadn't realized until this last reading, and that's one of the reasons I keep reading through the Bible over and over and over again and make it my, my goal every year to read through the whole Bible and then aside from my devotional stuff and my study and spiritual growth stuff, just to read through the Bible, mark things, note things as I go. I also highlight, that's what keeps me on. Really, I encourage everyone to learn to be a good highlighter. Uh, if you highlight, that means you read at least twice every time you read the page anyway. So uh, now I've read the Bible four times this year. Scoreboard you again. Um, psalm 119, one of, the, one of the themes that keeps flowing through that psalm is he is surrounded by enemies. He has adversaries everywhere. And his response to, to be impressed from all sides is to turn to God's word. He feels besieged, and that's why he needed God's peace, and he found God's peace and the freedom from stumbling because he spent time in God's Word. It'll work the same way for you. Don't settle for less than that peace. I want you to just remind you of this. Jesus paid the supreme price at the cross to bring all this peace to you. He died on the cross to pay for sin that we might have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he came to this earth. And, and so he, he leaves the unspeakable glory of heaven. He comes to the humility uh, of, of a manger scene. He gives up the adoration of angels for uh, the excitement of some simple shepherds. He leaves God's perfect heaven for a sinful, broken world, all to be our Prince of Peace. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And then he concludes uh, some of that, that part of his message in chapter 16. I've said these things to you, that in me you have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take, take heart. I've overcome the world. His peace doesn't depend on circumstances doesn't depend on human relationships. Our peace is all going to be wrapped up in our relationship to him. And he has secured that by his sacrifice. And Jesus doesn't say, in your lifetime, there's going to be peace on earth. He says, in fact, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. This world's a mess. And it's going to be a mess. But he's coming again to make it all right. But between here and there... He can bring peace even when the world around you is a mess because that's what he does. But that's for believers, for those who've surrendered their life to him. In your playlist on your uh, electronic device, how many of you have uh, any of the greatest hits of Francis Ridley Havergal? Anybody? Rockin' to Francis? Okay. She's one of the most gifted people of her generation. She was four years old. She was reading complex works of literature. By the time she was seven, she was composing poetry at a very high level. She was, uh, as a young woman, she was fluent, uh, accomplished in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Uh, she was a gifted vocalist in, in London, sang to huge throngs of adoring fans as, so, super popular uh, vocalist, brilliant mind. She came to Christ early in life, but her testimony is she didn't have a sense of peace about that. She, she knew she was belonged to Christ, but peace was fleeting for her. It felt far away. It felt like something she was always chasing, never grasping. And the Holy Spirit wouldn't let go of her in that. Continue to bring a sense of conviction to her heart, a desire for something different, something better, something more. So her testimony is at age 36, she read a little booklet uh, just titled, All for Jesus. And what it stressed, and I love this phrasing, it, it, it stressed the importance of making Christ the king in every corner of your life. Not just, oh yeah, Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. But He's going to be king in every corner of my life. Not just the parts that are easy to yield to Him, but every corner of my life. And that kept stirring in her and stirring in her and stirring in her until on December the 2nd, 1873, 
She had a fresh, complete surrender of everything. Every corner of her life surrendered to Jesus as her king. And she was so joy-filled. And she said this peace settled on her. She marked the day forever for the rest of her life. Now, after this all taking place in a... So I love this part of the story as a pastor. Uh, all this happens. She's in church. She wouldn't pay any attention to the sermon like all of y'all, but... So she has this, has this, no, some of you are riveted. Others are not so much. Uh, so she has this experience with the Lord. And then she has this dinner party with a bunch of influential people from the uh, London area after church. Ten people. And she knew that most of them were not followers of Christ. None of them had a surrendered relationship to Christ. She has such a burden for them. God just laid that on her. After what she'd experienced that day uh, in in her surrender to the Lord, it it so moved her. And she started praying, Lord, give me all in this house. Lord, give me all in this house. Those of you who are going to be getting together with family, some of whom are maybe far from God over Christmas, why don't you start praying that prayer for them? Lord, give me all in this house. Well, She finished up the dinner party. There was a visiting afterwards. When she walked out of that house, every person in the house had a relationship to Jesus and a surrendered every corner of my life, Jesus is king, kind of relationship to Christ. It's a great story. It marked her again. December the 2nd, all this is happening. Well, she was so excited. These pe- people she had known and loved and cared about, far from God, those who were just distanced from God, she reaches out. To, they all make commitments to Christ. December the 2nd is such a special day for her. She went home that night. She couldn't sleep, and she starts writing a poem. And uh, she called it her Consecration Hymn. And it just became her life's theme. And she also made it her habit that she would, every December 2nd, she would she would sit down with these words and she would rehearse them. Simple, simple, simple prayer to the Lord. But she would, she would just re-up on that surrender to Christ. And, uh, you know, I hope you'd make it your prayer today. There are a couple different versions of this in your hymnal. I want you to take a hymnal and open it to number 277. I, as my gift to you, I'm not going to sing this to you. But 277, and if you look down, words, Francis R. Havergal, 1836, 1879. And this was her consecration poem she wrote on December 2nd. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing. She's she's an accomplished singer. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my silver and my gold, my material things. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my will and make it thine. My will, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. And my heart, it shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. Maybe you'd make that your prayer today. Maybe you'd make that your commitment to the Lord today. Uh, Simple words. But maybe something that would carry you to some new places with the Lord. And I would pray that the biggest thing would be you take you to a place of peace. Through God our Father and the Lord Jesus the Christ.